And let me tell you two of the most important things I've learned about communication. Especially for women, you have to listen to the underlying argument. It is not really about what they are arguing about. It is what they are arguing for. There's something that is missing. You don't value me. You don't trust me. That's it. It's, it's not just, oh, I cooked for you, you know, I, you know and you didn't eat. It's, it's beyond that. She's feeling unappreciated. So you have to look for the underlying things. Okay, trust. I need to reassure her, you know, that I trust her, that I value her. That's the underlying issue. Sometimes if you are picking on the matter, that's why you wonder why arguments will never end. Because it's not about the argument. It's not about the argument. The underlying issues. And the woman is just trying to tell you, I need more attention in this marriage. I need more value in this marriage. Listen, you grow in discernment when you learn to pick those things. Pick what she's really saying that she's not saying. We want to talk about something very important. And the title of my charge this morning is Conflict, Conflict to Connection. Can you all say Conflict to Connection? That God can give us such a prolific wisdom such that what the enemy even meant for evil, what others go through, and it ends their relationship, breaks their marriage, even is used as an instrument to instead make you stronger. Conflict to connection. And I want to say this. First and foremost, this was the hardest thing I had to learn in marriage and that I'm still learning. And let me say this to you. If you can learn this, you are good to go. And I'm going to show you just how important this is in a minute. Please turn your Bibles. Proverbs chapter 24 verse 3. I want you to soak in the essence of what you're about to read. This is serious business. I mean, what you're about to read might be the difference between a marriage that is going to make it and a marriage that will not. Everybody with as much conviction as you can muster, Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3, 1, 2, go. Everybody read again, 1, 2, go. Oh my God, listen. It says, through wisdom is a house built. And I know that this is speaking in a more generic context, but I'm telling you this applies to love, relationship, and marriage. Through wisdom is a house built. Guess what? Love is not enough to build a home. Did you hear what I said? Love is not enough. It is important, but it's not enough. It did not say through love is a house built. It said through wisdom. And so your honest feeling is not enough. It says, and by understanding it is established. It means there is a level of capacity and proficiency that guarantees longevity in your love and relationship through wisdom. The reason this is important, I think the first person I heard this from years ago was Mount Moreau. And at the time he was talking, he had counseled homes for more than 30 years. And he said the very funny thing about people who have decided to divorce one another, holding their divorce papers right in their hands. And they will say, you know what? I still love him, but I can't live with him. And it was a conundrum. The reality that a lot of people do not recognize is that just because you love someone doesn't mean you can live with the person. It takes wisdom, it takes understanding to be able to build a home. Everybody say, through wisdom is a house built. Say, I'm going to build my house with wisdom. I'm going to establish it with understanding. It simply means there are things to learn. There are things to learn. Your honesty is not enough. You must build capacity. Just because you love him, you love her, does not mean you can live together. If you're going to learn to live peaceably with someone, it's going to, be, it's going to take intentionality. Another very important thing... I want to say, and it's important I preface every other thing I say with this, is that the goal for this teaching is not to put in you an image of perfection, an expectation of perfection. That's another mistake people make. You know, I told you something very profound last week if you were listening. A man named John Gotham of Gotham Institute, 
he took several decades to study several marriages about 4,000 of them and he came up with such a dependable scientific and psychological research that empowered him to be able to look at a marriage in a few minutes and tell with 90% accuracy if they are going to make it or not. It took him just a few minutes. And having gone through about 4,000 marriages with 90% accuracy, at least you can tell he knows what he's saying. But we're going to talk about that later. I said that to say this. He discovered that the difference between happy homes and homes that were not happy, marriages that will stand the test of times and marriages that will not stand the test of time was not conflict. He discovered that happy homes fought also. And about the same things that homes that did not make it through fought about. About money, about, you know, oh my God, I wish I had enough time to talk about that. When a little more money came into our marriage, half of the quarrels ended. Hey, God. <laughs> no, did I say quarrel? We're too spiritual for quarrel. I mean intense conversations. If you know what I mean. But it's important. The reason I'm saying this is because unintentionally, some of us, our expectations are high. Some of us, our expectations are too low. But I'm dwelling on the other extreme for now. Some of us, our expectations are high. Sometimes marriage no hard. Now you define the perfect spouse. It's part of it. <laughs> there will be misunderstandings. Listen, if you cannot accommodate misunderstandings, you are not ready. That's the important thing I want you to know. If you cannot accommodate it, I am telling you what I learned, and I learned the hard way. Oh, my God. Uh, listen, are you listening to me? Can I open up to you? So, one of the biggest mistakes I made when I was dating is that I compared with my ex just a little bit. And because we, the person I was dating before, we dated two years, and we didn't quarrel once. Yes, not once. Even when we're breaking up, I just, just don't think it's going to work. Oh, really? A minute. Oh. And we both cried. Well, we didn't exchange, we didn't, nothing, just moved on. I didn't realize that was a toxic trait. But some people, you know, let me tell you something, it's not always toxic. Peace is possible. Are you listening to me? But there's another extreme. <laughs> you know, but you know, when I brought it up, you know, PL is not always okay. You know, she's... She's your pastor. So she just said, why didn't you marry her? <laughs> Don't stress me, man. <laughs> if it was so good, why, didn't, why are you here? There's something I'm going to show you if I have the time. And I must have the time today. Because I know some of you were judging me in your mind. Here we go again. Don't worry, there's time today. And that's how that many of us love the way we were brought. In psychology, it's called attachment style. That we mirror the relationship between ourselves and our parents. We bring it into our relationship with our spouse. And so, I discovered I was what they called avoidant attachments. I will show you what that means. And it can be very dangerous. People like me can be very dangerous because we don't like to fight. If you cross the line in the friendship, you will just discover, I won't talk to you again. I will just draw the line and that's the end. And so what happened was very simple. And this is the first time it's coming out of my mouth. That's how dangerous we can be. I won't complain. I won't fight. We'll just end it. Uh, that's all. We'll move on. It's not you. It's me. So this was what happened. Just imagine. Look at all that God is doing through us by the grace of God. And now, move back maybe 15 years. And I'm trying to date someone. I have all this vision in my spirit. I know God is going to do all that he's doing now. And everybody who was around was a part of it working tirelessly. I will always hold in high esteem the people who saw me years ago and saw the hand of God. 
you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, if you, you, you believe in us now, do you understand? I don't really know how genuine that is. I appreciate it, but I don't know. But the people back then, the people who will give 5K, 2K, do you understand, to be a part of it? And then we're doing heavy projects. If you know about our ministry, we've always done big things. When I was graduating, we printed 10,000 copies of devotionals and gave it free. Then, I've been crazy for a long time, you see. And all of that was happening thanks to the love, the faith of partners and all of that. And now I'm dating someone who had never given a donation to the fellowship. I'm not materialistic. The fellowship has always had money. I have a grace by the grace of God. Check the history of this ministry. We've never lacked. I just told you, as an undergraduate, we printed 10,000 copies and gave it out free. So we already always had money. But it just, it just, I just quietly wondered, like, what is going on? But I'd, I had not learned to talk things through. I didn't bring it up. I just kept wondering. And so one day, I wanted to bring it up stylishly. I didn't know how to. So I just said, you know what? We have a project we want to do for the church. Can you loan me 15000 We didn't need 15000 I'm telling you, those of you who are aware, we printed devotionals every month, and it cost at least 600000 and we did it every month without fail. And then she borrowed me the money. And then, you know, I just kept it or something. And then months after, honestly, in my mind, I had some respite. That, well, at least she could part away with money. It's not as bad as I thought. Then months after, she came to see me, and we're talking, and then we're already going, and she said, hey, about that money <laughs> that I borrowed you. So I said, okay. You know, so I went, packaged the money in an envelope. Then I, in another envelope was a letter. <laughs> but, <laughs> I've changed. If you like, don't judge me. I'm, <laughs> I'm not doing it again. Look at the way some of you are judging me. <laughs> you, you, you don't understand. Some of you don't understand visionaries. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to excuse it, but you don't understand visionaries. How could you not see it? How could you not be? I'm not talking about a large amount. I'm not once, ah, let's be a part of this. 2K. If, if it was... Okay, give me the money back, but you know what? Take 2K, just add to this. Not once. The approach was wrong. Do you understand? And you know, I was in a school that didn't use phones. So maybe she thought, <laughs> God, the more I explain it to sound worse. So she must have thought it was a love letter. <laughs> On the way, in, in the bus, just opened it. She tried to call me, we don't have phone. <laughs> so. The reason I'm telling you this, listen. Now, imagine bringing that attitude into a marriage. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? You, you don't want to talk things through. I told you last week, there's a reason women nag. You can be so poor at communication that they want any reaction, bad or good. Just react. Just show that you are alive in the <laughs> In this relationship, I'll take anything. If, if it's anger, even if it's anger. Let me tell you something. To many ladies, anger is reassuring. It means you care. Some of you know what I'm saying. Women, if you have, I'm not saying if you are like that. If you have a clue what I'm saying and you are honest, raise your hand like this. Just, you don't have to raise it up. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Something like this. I'll take it. Anger is reassuring. You cannot just be stonewalling. You know, there's a space for that sometimes. If tempers are just high, you might want to take some time off. But listen, there are four things that that psychologist said the moment he sees, he knows that this marriage will not make it. 
In fact, not only does he know the marriage will not make it, he has a timeline. They won't make it past 12 years. Predictably. The four things are criticism. Always criticizing. Some people don't know how to have a dialogue without criticizing. Wind blows, a cop falls down. Why are you so careless? The wind blew. They cannot separate the incidents from the person. They must add labels. You always be careful of labels like that. You always criticism. Number two, defensiveness. Defensiveness. Can I tell you something? It's been proven the leading cause of, dif- dif- of divorce. It's been proven scientifically, psychologically, that the leading cause of divorce is unmet expectation. I kept expecting you to make these adjustments. I kept trying to tell you. You didn't even try. You didn't even listen to me. So I began to stonewall. And there was no improvement until everything fell apart. I am telling you that communication will be the difference between a marriage that makes it and a marriage that does not. What did I say is number one, please? What is number two? All right. Number three, contempt. Contempt. I think I talked about that last week. Number four, stonewalling. Stonewalling, where there is just a wall. (laughs) Married but single. Very dangerous thing. But like I said, this man also discovered that when the ratio of the good in the marriage is greater than the ratio of the bad, they will still make it. If it is five to one, you're going to make it. And that marriages that dwell on the negatives. So, oh my God, please, can I talk to you? I was trying to talk about this last week, but you don't understand how important this is. Now, this is what the Bible says. It says, walk in the Spirit. You know the text, don't you? And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Some of you don't understand how profound that is. That if I find a walk of the flesh in my life, there are two things that I can try to do. Sorry, walk on this microphone. It's just echoing or something. There are two things that I can try to do. I can try to defeat that habit, which is not wrong. But there is a more excellent way. So, and now I'm seeing a walk of the flesh in my life. But it says, if I walk in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit doesn't have to be the direct opposite of what I'm doing in the flesh. It just has to be a walk in the Spirit. That the positive will outweigh and eventually conquer the negative. That so, for instance, someone is battling lust. But as long as he continues to walk in love, walk in peace, have a prayer life, have a study life, Even if what he is studying is not directly addressing lust, lust will begin to win. Did you hear what I just said? That all the fruits of the spirits are connected and all the fruits of the flesh are connected. Your phone addiction might be feeding your pornography addiction. Because in the realm of the spirit, it's the same thing. You are feeding the flesh. You have not learned to delay gratification. To put your body under. Your mind is trained to say yes to every temptation. Whether it is that temptation. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm letting you know that some battles are fought indirectly in the realm of the spirit. And so, a couple might be having strain. But as long as there are structures that keep bringing them together. When do you go out on dates? When do you talk? When do you sit with each other and touch base? There are some things that as long as you are, that they are existent in your marriage, it will be hard for things to fall apart. Please, are you getting what I'm saying? 
The reason I'm saying this is because conflict resolution is not really about the conflict all the time. The way to make, make it through some tough times is some other positive things. Some people think if we don't always talk things through, if I don't tell you, if I don't get you to agree, you are wrong. We cannot move forward. Uh, it doesn't always work that way. If you don't believe me, at least believe this person who has proven it psychologically. Saint, is it, what I'm telling you is a fact. Just make up your mind. I won't dwell on the negatives. And that no matter how bad things get, I will keep investing in things that can save the marriage. Amen, somebody. You know, last week, single people were saying, ah, I dwelt on only on marriage. Don't you understand? This message is primarily for you. For people who are married, it's going to take the grace of God. Maybe you are too late in some areas. It's you I'm talking to. You're the one who needs to learn this now. And so you need to approach the subject of communication with understanding. There has to be a curiosity. You have to be curious. How can I understand this person? Unravel this person. This mystery of a spouse. Especially as a guy, you want to understand a woman. You're going to... Man, you're going to have to walk. Woman is a language. Don't you understand? It's a language. You have to understand their communication. <laughs> Don't you understand? With experience, you will get better. You will never really understand it. It's like God. <laughs> but you will get better. If you are out... And a woman is hungry. She won't tell you, can we go to a restaurant? She will say, are you hungry? <laughs> don't, don't, because the way to get you to take her out is to first convince you you are hungry. Then when you are hungry, it will now be your idea for both of us to go out. You have to learn to speak. I say, woman is a language. You learn it with effort. And God does have a sense of humor. He made us so different and we must work together. You know, I was reading a psychological report and I was laughing, holding my stomach. You know, the, according to the psychological report, a lot of women, when the space they are in is disorganized, their stress level rises. They can't deal with clutter. They can't deal with it. They can't deal with it. But the average guy can sit in a refuse dorm and be watching football like this. The guy, you know, he's not stressed by it. This is the funny part. Guess what makes him stressed? Asking him to clean up. <laughs> it's the opposite that makes him stressed. Now, those two people will now come together as a couple. You know, as the man is entering the house, oh, how are you, honey? He drops his bag in the parlor. He removes his jacket, hangs it on the railing. He, you know, as he's going, he's removing his tie, putting it. <laughs> Do you know what was happening? Just my illustration, a woman is cringing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, dropping it like this, removing the shoes. Ah, if you see what I went through today, And you must deal with that. You must deal with that. Two simple things I want to tell you about learning about communication. Number one is that we are different, which is, which is the point I just made. You must understand we are different. Women are wired differently. Men are wired differently. What I just said is the real reason a lot of times we just quarrel. Because you expect a man to act like a woman. You expect a woman to act like a man. 
There are some things, you, you see, <laughs> some things are not as obvious as you think they should be. You are thinking like a woman and you expect us to understand. Now, you are angry about something. You just carry your face like, hmm. Two days. And they say, are you sure you're okay? I'm fine. And then the man says, okay. <laughs> and continue. You have to understand, as far as a man is concerned, if there's an issue, you tell me. Brothers, Abby. Give me I asked you, is there a problem? You said, no. I like it. I'm hearing the murmuring. <laughs> Brothers, let me advise you. There's a gift of the Spirit called discernment. You go need them. Because you see what I just described. If you try it, first and foremost, you upset me. You did not know. I started reacting. You did not know. You now asked me, am I all right? I, I didn't say no. I said, mm -mm. you don't know. You don't know there's a difference. Yeah. No and mm -mm are not the same. Oh. Ah. <laughs> no, you are tossing. Mm -mm. <laughs> you now say, okay. Ah. But let me just say this. Ladies, sometimes. Just lay it out. And assume you are talking to a child sometimes. Don't take that literally. Otherwise, there will be a problem. But, <laughs> but just help us with some clarity, some context. After a while, he will keep up. He will catch up. He will understand. So number one, understand that we are different. Number two, understand that there is a reason you are the way you are. Oh, my God. Please, did you hear what I just said? You know, it was Reverend Albert that said something. He was preaching in the, on the island church. And then he said, you will see two couples. They're about to enter marriage. And then they'll be promising each other, I will be the best husband you have ever seen in your life. The woman too will say, I will be the best wife you've ever... Have you seen wedding vows these days? With my left hand, I will catch a grenade. With my right hand, I will hold the sun, the moon, and 37 stars. Together, we will go ahead. You'll be saying, oh, hey. <laughs> you said you will hold... <laughs> you said you will hold grenade. Come on, conversation, you know, if you hold. <laughs> you see, well, that, that was good, Abby. That was, was, so, sorry, what's that my nickname again? <laughs> you all are enabling me, you're enabling me. <laughs> Listen, please. Permit me to bore you for the next five minutes because I want to read you one of the most important research I've ever seen in my life. The most important. You have to know it. And I want you to read up on what psychologists call attachment style. Attachment style. And this is what has been proven that the way we love the way we make friends is a reflection of the relationship we had with our primary caregivers when we were growing up. Proven scientifically. 
your primary caregiver, your dad or your mom, or whoever was in their stead, the way they treated you has formed your understanding of relationships and has influenced in a very powerful but subconscious way your love decisions in your life. You know, when someone went through this research, she discovered, for instance, why she chose the career she chose. Because when she was a child, she wanted her parents' attention, and they would not listen to her, they would not pay attention to her. They were always watching news, spe specifically weather reports. So, subconsciously, as a child, it was ingrained in her subconscious as an original idea that she wanted to be a newscaster. Subconsciously, she wanted attention from her parents. That if you find this so fascinating and I want your attention, then I will be a newscaster. And she went on subconsciously pursuing a career decision. Went to the university, graduated just for approval. And so let me read this to you. In 1978, Mary Ainsworth and her colleagues discovered three major patterns through which infants attach themselves to caregivers. Children were put in an environment with their mothers and the children were free to explore the room. And so now, this is what they did. The children are with their parents or their mother. And then after a while, the mom is asked to leave the room. And they watch how the child behaves when the parent leaves. Do you know that says a lot? That single detail tells you how close they are. Again, we're talking about attachment, right? And so the, the mother is going. They even become freer. They start playing more. That tells you something. Some immediately begin to cry. You know? And then not just that. After a while, they bring in a stranger. Some, some children reacted and interacted with a stranger in no different way than how they reacted or re interacted with their mom. It tells you something. It tells you something. And so this is what was discovered, and I will just begin with So now they, they checked three things. Number one, how comfortable each child was when they were physically away from their mothers in a strange environment, emphasis on strange environments. That a child is in a strange environment and unfamiliar territory, yet your primary caregiver lives and there is no change in behavior. It tells you something. Please, are you all listening to this? Number two, how the child interacted with the stranger. Number three, how each child greeted the mother when she returned. Based on the observation, they divided children into three groups. Secure anxious and avoidant please listen carefully some of you i'm about to read the story of your life what did i say secure anxious and avoidant okay so infants characterized under secure attachment actively seek and maintain proximity with their mom they may not interact with a stranger at all if the mother leaves. However, they showed signs of distress when their mother left, but they rarely cried. So they showed signs of distress, but they rarely cried. They showed less anxiousness because they were secure and believed their mother's love and responsibility towards their needs. Infants characterized under anxious attachment were seen to be somewhat resistant to the mother. However, once contact with the mother was made, they showed strong intentions to maintain such contact. Hi, my God. Have you ever tried to date someone who kept giving you mixed signals? Kept acting like the person, she didn't care. But eventually, when you drew closer, you discovered the person really cared. Some of you, you've not experienced something like that before. Anyway, we are, we are still starting. So the child was acting indifferent. However, when the mom came, the child showed strong intentions to maintain that contact. 
So in colloquial terms, they formed at first <laughs> because they did not want to be disappointed. And then they held on to the little attention that they could get because they did not know the next time it will come. Are you paying attention? So it was observed that the mothers of such infants had slow response time to the children's needs. So the children in this category struggled to adopt, adapt and adjusted adequately to the situation in such a way that... Uh, they, anyway, let's move on. An infant with an avoidant attachment characterized as was characterized as displaying little or no tendency to seek proximity to the mother. The infant of, often showed no distress during separation from the mother, interacted with the stranger similarly to how he or she would interact with the mom, showed slight signs of avoidance, turning away, avoiding eye contact when reunited with the mom. This may be because the parents ignored attempts to be intimate by displaying reject, rejecting behaviors such as being uncomfortable with physical contact. Let me tell you something. If you have a parent, either dad or mom, that was never comfortable with physical contact, you need repair. Did you hear what I just said? This is serious. You know, you've heard me talk about my parents. My mom's wonderful. My dad is wonderful. Now I'm thinking what to say or what not to say. They're both church members. I will never be where I am without both of them. I look at my life and I see a perfect blend of their influences. I can tell you one thing for sure. My mom is the sweetest human being you will ever see. But I will not be where I am if it was just her. <laughs> Because as sweet as she is, very content with her life, with all that God has given her, I needed someone who could be a push. But my dad was not just a balance. <laughs> hey, my God. Mr. Itukire. Ah, God. You have to understand. <laughs> Can I talk to you? You see, some of the things that people admire about me today, it is because God dealt with the extremes, cut them away, and healed me. I'm telling you. Because sometimes, even your drive can be a dysfunction. Are you ready for this or not? I grew up in a home where every time I came second, my dad would say, uh, well done, but the person who came first does not have two heads. Great dad, make no mistake. Do you understand? But you, 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 you have to understand, he, hey, my God, daddy, I love you, but I'm trying to teach them. He never hugged me once to say, well done, good job, not once. I will never forget, I came home with results, common entrance, 566 over 600. I will never forget, he was in the vehicle like this, you know, and I said, daddy, it's my result. He looked at it, he said, well done, you know, I gave me back. Now, let me tell you how stuff like that can affect you. It can affect your vulnerability. Now, let me tell you something. Pros and cons. It made me toughen up. The standards of excellence are so high. And now you see me driving at excellence now. God has healed all those things. There is a holy, godly drive for excellence. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Are you listening to me? Uh, I used to be a psychopath, but I'm fine. <laughs> so, when, so now you are used to performing at a high level without any gratification. 
You don't understand. You see, God has healed me, but um, you see, that's why you don't understand. You, you are dragging me on Twitter. You expect me to cry. You don't know who I am. All my life, I've done great without approval. Without, well done. Thank you. I don't need it. <laughs> I know really normal like that. <laughs> you know, if you appreciate me, I, I, I appreciate it. But if you don't, then we move. So there are pros and there are cons. Now, how does someone like that appreciate his wife? Okay, you look after the child, you want a medal. I don't want what, what, is it. Is it not your job? <laughs> I'm telling you things that you now have to learn. Please, if you like, look at me and be, I'm talking about us. <laughs> so I'm telling you so that you can find out things that you need to work on. So if, if, if you ever, let me tell you something. The average person who grows up in an African home needs healing. The average person. You need healing. You need healing. You need to learn vulnerability. You know when my dad knew there was a problem? <laughs> For the first time, almost ever, we found ourselves. You see, when you're living in a big house, it's very easy to be avoidant. Good morning, sir. Avoid eye contact, avoid proximity. There was now a time we had to stay in an apartment, only one room. Ha! It was one week I thought I would die. I'll never forget. Primary six. So, he will be sitting on the... I'll be sitting on the bed. He will come and sit down. We'll stand up. Subconscious. So, when I stood up, I didn't know he had been watching me. He said, what is the problem? Am I, what is the... In my mind, I said, since when? Uh, <laughs> me, African dad, tell you, express yourself. <laughs> you don't know when. Uh, leave me. <laughs> Since when? <laughs> Let me tell you something. When you understand where, where they also are coming from, you will know they've tried. Do you understand? Two things. We are great now. And number two, when I see where he's coming from, the kind of dysfunction he had to avoid, I mean, survive. I even give him credit. He tried. To produce good children, he even tried. Do you understand what I'm saying? But at the same time, it was still a struggle. It was something I had to... And the thing is, I thought I was fine until he told me, I love you for the first time. I'll never forget. I was about to get married. <laughs> I was on the phone like they said, okay, so bye-bye. I love you. Hey! That's when I knew. I, ne I never knew I had dysfunction until that day. I never knew I was seeking. You see, the fact that I don't seek approval from everyone does not mean I don't seek approval from him. That day, he said, I love you. I love you too! Ah, that's it. Ah. What's, what's going on? And I now came back. To, ah. <laughs> ah, what's going on? We lose God now. These are real issues. Like I would often say, laugh but listen. African men. Let me say this. Your culture gives you the subconscious impression that you don't have to work. That being a man is enough. That just being a man is enough. You, you don't understand how deep these things are. You know, I was listening to, listening to an interview. I, I saw it somewhere. Olive Modi was having an interview 
with a landlord. He first started with giving house, you know, and then the landlord was saying, as a landlord, I don't like to give houses to single women or to women, uh, single mothers. And so she was saying, why? And he was giving his reasons. Uh, as a woman, if you are ripe for marriage, you should have a man over you, okay? And then she asked the question, what about people who had to leave their homes because their husbands were beating them? You know what he said? He said, endure it. He said, endure it. He said, if your husband is beating you, endure it. He said, there is a reason he's beating you. He said, listen, let me tell you. There is problem. There is problem. I want to beg you in the name of Jesus. Let me tell you something. If you forget any other thing I say, never forget this. The number one rule of communication in marriage, especially with a woman, is empathy. You must learn to put yourself in her shoes. Being an African doesn't teach you to do so naturally. You just come back. She has three kids. She's nursing, literally nursing on her own. Then you, you just open the fridge. Where is enough this house? Ah, ah. Come back from church together. And I'm wondering, why is there no food at, by this time? You were both in church. Can I tell you something? One of the biggest things you can do as a man, make things easier for your wife. Make things easier for your wife. Keep thinking, how can I make things easier for you? Let me tell you something. When a woman sees you are actively walking towards that, There will be a depth of appreciation. Even you will be surprised. Empathy. Please. It is true that the Bible says that the man is the head. But the Bible did not say he is the coconut head. There is a difference. You are the head of the home, not the coconut head. It does not mean you can't receive advice. It does not mean you are all-knowing. You are not always right. Don't be an oppressor. There's an image you have to correct. That you, you, you're honking. From outside, your children begin to scamper. They turn off the TV. Quickly carry it well. Soak it with water. Touch the TV so that it won't be hot. You know, run to their room. You know, sit and, you know, are you like it? The emperor, the conqueror, the lion, the, you know, yeah, like the, you know that song by Dom Wen? You know I think, no, Frank Edwards, you know, Zobu, Zobu, you know, are you happy? When, when your wife goes out of her way, cleans the whole house, all those things, have you ever said, ah, thank you, you did so well, wow. Have you ever really appreciated her, pampered her? The reason you must learn it is because your culture gives you the impression it's your rights. Please, are you listening to this? <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you don't learn this, <laughs> hallelujah. So I've spoken to the men. Can I speak to the women now? You like violence. Yeah, but let's know now. That was nice. Okay, wait. When I say it, you do it again. So, can I speak to the women now? Actual time. Ah! <laughs> you are naughty. I'm thinking what to say and what not to say because I don't like stress. Women, <laughs> should I talk to you or not? All right. They said I should talk. <laughs> we said don't talk. Oh. Well, let's talk. 
All right, let's talk. You see, many men, I said it last week, that it's a romantic fantasy that men want to be accepted for who they are. And there is a level to which that's extreme. But there is also a level to which that makes sense. It is extreme if the man is not ready to put in any work to improve at all. But it is not extreme if the man is honestly trying. And if you have to understand that the average man, the one that have sense, they're not, they're not so many, but you know, but they, the, the ones that have sense, they have one mission, just to make their wives happy. They want to make you happy. But the unfortunate reality is that sometimes they eventually get to a point where they feel they will never be good enough for you. They will never be good enough. You have to understand that the way a man is wired, he's wired to be a giver. And because he's wired to be a giver, he depends on you. He depends on you to appreciate what he's giving, to make meaning of what he's giving. And so... The way you criticize and give that feedback, you must do it understanding that even if men form hard guy, they are sensitive. They are sensitive. And that feedback is not just what you say, it's how you say it. You know, I saw something years ago, I mean, not, not too long ago, and it was so profound. This guy talked about his ex and his current spouse, how they reacted to something as little as his, you know, beard bombs. So when he would hug his ex, she would just go, oh, um, you know, she, she had a sensitive skin. Oh, your, your beard uh, makes me uncomfortable. And all he kept hearing is, I'm not good enough. But this other lady he eventually got married to, Every time they hug, when he had, he, he had a clean shave, she would say, oh, I like it when you have shaved. That's feedback. Oh. You see the difference? Oh, I like it when you shave. He, he said, because of that, it was a mental note. Every two days. <laughs> I, my God. You said I can talk to you, right? Women have a superpower that has been reflected as weakness in this generation. Let me say this to you first and foremost. That superpower has been abused by irresponsible men. But in the right setting, under the right context, it is still powerful. Are you ready for what I'm about to say? I gave a subtle example when I was talking about how a woman tells you she's hungry. When she's, on, she's out on a date with you, she says, are you hungry? You know, so, so subconsciously, women are wired to put an idea in your mind and make you take initiative for the collective good. What if you learn that consciously? There's a movie. How many of you have seen the movie Inception? All right. In the movie Inception, they came up with a technology where you could enter the mind of someone, drop an idea in the mind. And when the person comes back, the idea will seem original. I am telling you, women have that superpower. Women have that superpower. And so, for instance, it is proven that instead of telling men what to do all the time, if you allow them to take initiative, instead of saying, oh, this box is broken, fix it. If you say, ah, oh, what do you think we can do to this box? The man will feel... He say, okay, so I'll just call the carpenter. We'll just, 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 this, the same thing. I'll give you a Bible example. This one is sensitive. I will ask you again. Should I talk or should I not talk? All right. We read up about Esther. Forgetting that the queen had an ex. And there is so much to learn. Because it is the same man treating two different women drastically different. You could make an argument for Vashti. She had a right. Why will you just call me to come and entertain your guests? But the question is, does that strategy work particularly for powerful men? Does it work? Listen, if your goal is to insist on your rights, fine. 
if your goal is to have a happy home, to work with someone that you trust for a collective goal, then if there is a more excellent way, use it. That same king that Vashti wanted to use Agidi, Esther, <laughs> she used submission to, she, Esther used submission to get him to kill. You know the story, don't you? Sometimes she came in like this. <laughs> I said, you are powerful. You don't understand. The, the hardest man in the world. If you know how to pull the strings, all the things you have been quarreling about, he will give you. He will, he will give you his kingdom. Men, I told you, men are more romantic. Read the story about Herod. Just small down, so he said, ask me anything to the half of my kingdom. Half of my down, so which kind of leg? Ah, uh, 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 you see, I am, t I am telling you, a man can go to war, conquer battles, take over territory, then small dance, he will give you half. You are arguing because you don't know. This does not in any way exonerate him from his excesses and all of that. But if you find a way to let him know that fundamentally, if you first and foremost accept him, you accept him, you believe in him, you trust him. Because men struggle. It's a dilemma. There are superheroes everywhere. Everywhere. They go to the work, to the office, they are killing it. They are successful. They are shouldering their entire family sometimes, especially in Africa, doing everything. The only place where he is constantly aware of his inadequacies is in the home. Then now you are wondering why you, the friendship is being affected. You remind him of everything he ought to be, but he's not. What if you find a proper way, a better way? Men also, there is a way to communicate. You know, my God, there's a mistake guys make. Uh, guys, when guys are quarreling, it's in the context. When guys are quarreling, they can say anything to each other and it's just bants. <laughs> Let me tell you guys, women are not like that. Oh. Don't say what you don't mean. They will not forget. They may forgive. At least they say they will forgive. Ah, uh, okay. Whether they forgive, only God knows. God is the ultimate judge. <laughs> because sometimes you wonder, you'll be surprised. 15 years later, she'll just say, ah. You say, what's that? You say, I remember the day. You say, ah! <laughs> That's how that day. Hey! Don't try it, though. In the heat of the argument, just say, sometimes I wonder why I married you. Hey! See, as a guy, it's just bands. You want her to know that you <laughs> you're not feeling what she's doing. Don't try it. <laughs> Please, are you listening to me? I want to talk to the guys again as I begin to round off. Four things, four very important ways you can create an environment of safety for your wife. Number one, you must create a non-judgmental environment so that she can tell you what she feels. She can tell you how she feels. I'll be honest with you, they will abuse it. But it's important. Number two, this is important. A clear line of communication. Clear line. She must be able to say, okay, I know how to reach my husband. Or at least every two weeks we go out, we have dinner, and we've established it as an ordinance. We ask each other, so what can I do better? In what way can I improve? That's a clear line of communication. If there is no clear line of communication, things will pile up. She will begin to nag. I told you why last week. And you'll be saying, well, she, she nags a lot. She nags. Uh -huh. Clear 
clear line of communication. If she has to fight you to get your attention, she will fight you. And I'm, talk I'm not talking about physical abuse, please. All right? I'm just talking about nagging. And I'm not saying it is always right. I'm just explaining why you are seeing the reaction you are seeing so that you can adjust. Please, is this making sense at all? Yes, Number three, there must be a deep sense of understanding. A deep sense of understanding. Uh, and number four, and women tell me if this is important or not. She must feel prioritized. Uh -huh. She must feel prioritized. Be busy with your work, prioritize her. Be busy with whatever you're doing, prioritize her. She must feel prioritized. As a round off, I just want to touch on one very important thing that affects marriages, and that's defensiveness. I told you one of four things that with 90% accuracy determines marriages that will fail is defensiveness. So what are signs of defensiveness? Because some people don't even know. You can be defensive. You can be a defensive person and not know. Number one, making excuses. Making excuses. They can't bring up something and say, well, I think you should have done this better. You, you immediately deflect. Blame someone else, something else. Push it to external circumstances. Oh, it's because of this. Making excuses is a sign of defensiveness. Number two, cross complaining. This one, please write it down. Cross complaining. Ah, uh -uh, dairy. You said dinner will be ready. I'm, I'm hungry. Well, you said you would take out the trash yesterday. Did you take it out? Cross complaining. Is it familiar or not? <laughs> Counter arguments. Before you know it, one argument will lead to another argument, to another argument. You will now arrive at Orile. You are wondering, how did we get here? You have left the major arguments. Cross complaining. It's people who are defensive, it's very hard to get them to focus on an issue, solve it, and move on. They will say, You too, you too. Is that not, is that not how you too? Number three, yes, but. This one is more subtle. Just call it yes, but. They will agree, but immediately evaluate the agreement. <laughs> yes, but it's because of Yes, but you too. Yes. But. Number four, body language and tone change. Some people, the moment you are giving them feedback, their tone will just change. The body language. And like I said, it is because, more, more often than not, because of your upbringing. Listen, if you grew up in a very authoritative environment, you'll be defensive. Because subconsciously, everyone who wants to cage you, you will see them as that primary caregiver under whom you had to walk on eggshells and you, you will resist. You will resist. Have you ever said something in the calmest tone to someone, maybe not your spouse, but to someone, and then you are surprised at the reaction because there is something about insecurity that you, you filter what the person hears, you hear your own insecurity, it's loud and resounding, and you respond based on what the person did not say, but what your, your insecurity reflected that the person said. Before you know it, the, you, the person said one, you have said 15. I just, the person is surprised. What is going on? These are things to watch out for. You must learn to be able to take it. Take honest feedback. Not every time guns blazing. The good news is you can get better at it. Please, are you listening to me? 
Just to be sure I'm not wasting my time. Say I'm a doer of the word. Say it again. I'm a doer of the word. Hallelujah. So how do you deal with it? Number one, if need be, take a short break. Take a short break. Please, taking a short break is, the, is different from stonewalling. And please, women, I can kneel and beg you. If the man says, you know what? I will talk about this later. That's not the time to be following him. That's how every time. You see, sorry. He's trying to remove himself from this situation. You are following him with commentary. Eh? So that's how uh, you think you're going to. <laughs> Try. Give it time. Give it time. The Bible says a soft answer turns away wrath. Turns away wrath. If he needs that time, if he needs that space, please give him time. Oh, there was a couple. He heard a sermon like this. Remove yourself. Ah, my God. His wife didn't get the memo. So, they were quarreling. It was getting heated. He said, you know what? We'll talk about this on another time. As he was going, the woman followed him. He entered the kitchen. She followed him. He came out. Entered the room. Followed him. Climbed the bed as if he was lying down. She sat in front of him and continued nagging. <laughs> Sometimes take a break. The person by your side may need it. So respectfully, give the person she can say, take a break. Take a, you know, calm down. <laughs> Number two, stick to the subject matter. This one is hard for some people. But please stick to the subject matter. Stick to the subject matter. And let me tell you two of the most important things I've learned about communication. Are you ready to listen, listen to this? Especially for women, you have to listen to the underlying arguments. It is not really about what they are arguing about. It is what they are arguing for. There's something that is missing. You don't value me. You don't trust me. That's it. It's, it's not just, oh, I cooked for you, you know, I, you know and you didn't eat. It's, it's beyond that. She's feeling unappreciated. So you have to look for the underlying things. Okay. Trust I need to reassure her, you know, that I trust her, that I value her. That's the underlying issue. Sometimes, if you are picking on the matter, that's why you wonder why arguments will never end. Because it's not about the arguments. It's not about the argument. The underlying issues. And the woman is just trying to tell you, I need more attention in this marriage. I need more value in this marriage. So, listen, you grow in discernment when, to, when you learn to pick those things. Pick what she's really saying that she's not saying. Amen, somebody. That is a life-saving tip right there. Number two, it is called future focus. This will change your life if you learn it. Imagine you communicated this way. I'm upset about something that happened, so I want to make a request. Now, when you put it this way, you are no longer making it about what has already happened. You are positioning yourself to avoid it in the future. So it's no longer about the present. It's no longer about what you're quarreling about. I, I wasn't happy about this, so I want to make a request for the future. Did you get that? It's a future focus. It's a future focus. And sometimes when men react to feedback, it's because of how you make them feel. In their mind, they're saying, I will do better. You don't have to castigate me. You don't have to emasculate me. Just give me the chance to do better. So when you say, this works not just for men, but for women too. You know what? I don't like this. So in, I want to make a request. When we find ourselves in this situation, let's do it this and this and this way. Amen, somebody. And as we close, I just want us to read a text that we know very well. Turn your Bibles to the big book of Proverbs. Did you learn anything? Proverbs chapter 15, 
verse 1 and 2. We'll read this and then we pray. Thank you, Jesus. Media team, put it up here. It says, a soft answer turns away wrath. Everybody read together, want to go. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A harsh word does what? All right, verse 2, want to go. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge correctly, but the mouth of the fool pours forth. Hallelujah. Pours forth. Meaning, no filter. Everything on your mind, you just say. Pours forth. Even that expression is funny. Eh? Why you they spit on me now? You they spit. You they, why you they? You just they pour. Say, I'm a doer of the word. Hallelujah. Please stand to your feet. What I just said will affect every relationship in your life, not just romantic relationships. It will make you a better colleague at the office. Can I ask you this? Everything I talked about, go and do further research. Listen to this sermon again and again. When we put media out, interact with them as someone who is intermeddling with wisdom, with the aim of getting better. We will be better. Say loud, amen. amen. We won't transfer trauma to our children. Say loud, amen. amen. You have to understand how likely it is that the same thing you complained about with your parents, you do the same thing to your children. You do the same thing. Everything you hated, everything you cried about, complained about, now you are doing the same thing. In the name of Jesus, I reject negative patterns. It ends with me. Say, it ends with me. It ends with me. No matter how pushed you are, speak the right words over your kids. You'll be surprised. All those things you hated, they have become a program. If you're not careful, it's part of the moment you can say, you can just look at your child and say something. Call your child names. No, break those patterns. Come on, are you with me? Call them what you want to see in their lives. Call them what you want to see. Call them what you want to see. And only what you want to see. You can correct them, but don't call them names. Don't transfer aggression. Be determined not to repeat cycles of abuse. It ends with me. It ends with me. It ends with me. Say this, my children will not be afraid of marriage because of me. Come on, say it again. Say, my children will not be afraid of marriage because of me. I want you to call out to the Lord for help right now. I'll give you a few minutes.